This video is sponsored by Raycon. The first time I saw him put on the helmet, I looked at him and I said, Robert, you are Iron Man. I mean, how amazing is that? For the rest of your life, you are. Let me take you back to May 2008. I was, what, eight years old? That's weird. And Marvel Studios, they weren't owned by the mouse. They were an independent film company. How freaking weird is that? Marvel Studios was an independent film company and Iron Man wasn't the popular icon that he is today. Hell, he wasn't even popular. He wasn't Spider-Man, he wasn't Batman, he wasn't Superman, so the average person didn't give a damn. That's really weird. I keep saying weird, but it is weird. It's insane to think about how back then, only 12 years ago, Marvel Studios were the underdog. It was a big risk to bank on an Iron Man movie. It was an even bigger risk to put it out the same summer as this beast. Imagine if Iron Man had bombed. Imagine if it wasn't Robert Downey Jr. Imagine if the movie was underwhelming. How fundamentally different would the film industry be right now? Just think about that. I know I rag on the more recent MCU films a lot, I'm often called overly critical, a pretentious douchebag faux intellectual cape shit loving clown, which is completely fair, but I want all these things to all be unique, personal, meaningful. Oh hi Top, buzz off, you just hate the MCU, blah 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 blah, look I get it, but screw all that because I fucking love Iron Man. I think Iron Man is an extraordinarily well crafted film, a movie that takes risks, that's creative, that's honest, that's both mature and extremely youthful, that was fresh back then and maybe even fresher today. Damn, it's just solid. It's just balls on a filmmaker. It's just great. But first, you know what sucks? Wires, plugs, cables, wired headphones. They're always getting tangled and definitely don't make you feel like Tony Stark. That's why I'm excited to talk to you guys about the sponsor of this video, Raycon. If you're still using wired headphones, I'm here to tell you that upgrading to these wireless earbuds will not only make your life at least 30 times more convenient, but will give you the freedom to move as much as you want, wherever you want, whenever the hell you want want. If you enjoy doing anything active while listening to some tunes, you know how wired headphones always end up smacking you in the face, popping out of your ear, and sometimes those tangled bastards even kidnap you and force you to build a Jericho missile. F*** those wires. But with the Raycon wireless earbuds, you're free to move as much as you want without suffering the emotional and physical abuse that comes with traditional wired headphones. I edited the video you're watching right now using these, which meant that I could move around instead of being tied to this uncomfortable chair. I felt like a real Iron Man. Best of all, you don't need to be a billionaire arms dealer to afford them. They start at half the price of other premium wireless earbuds. Designed by platinum music artists and audio engineers, the quality of the audio is incredible. The latest model, the Raycon E25, comes in a variety of colors with six hours of playback time, seamless Bluetooth pairing, a discreet and stylish look, and six different sizes to best fit your ear to give you the nice, noise-isolating fit. To upgrade your earbud game today, click on my custom link in the description. That's buyraycon.com slash hightop to get 15% off your first first order. You'll be supporting my channel and getting amazing earbuds in return. Come on, we all win. There's Iron Man, the film, and then there's the insane story of how Kevin Feige, John Favreau, Robert Downey Jr., and the entire cast and crew made Iron Man. Iron Man didn't have a finished script. It had a constantly changing story. One draft had the Mandarin, one draft had Crimson Dynamo, I think one draft even had Howard Stark turn out to be secretly alive the entire time and then turn into the villain. To put it simply and quote the dude himself, They had no script, man. They had an outline. The spirit in which it was shot and the way we did it was was like you might do a, uh, a small independent art film. You know how insane that is? That the movie turned out as well, as nuanced, as layered, and as impactful as it did? That's a testament to every single person who worked on it. They figured it out as they went along, and what they figured out turned out to be the start of the biggest series of films ever. But they had no idea that was going to be the case. This could be anything from a flop to a, a moderate single, you know, where you get on base and just keep plugging along in your career to something that, you know, where, where it's beyond what people's expectations are. I, I really don't know how people are going to react to this thing. I know the people close to me seem to like it. I know that there's funny scenes, that there's scenes with a lot of heart. There's a lot of truth in it. I love the performances. I love the cast. So I don't know. This is the shot that started the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe. No superheroes, no purple space rocks, no Guardians of the Galaxy. This is the show. 
Iron Man hits the ground running, flying, zooming, exploding with such efficient character development in such a short amount of time. With one dialogue scene, some ACDC, a couple of explosions, and a capture, we understand the tone of the film, the style, and most importantly, we understand who Tony Stark is at this point in time. The first glimpse we get of Tony is a shot of his hand holding a drink riding in the back of a Humvee. The first conversation Tony has with the soldiers isn't much of a conversation, but an exercise in ego boosting. Is it true you went 12 for 12 with last year's maximum cover models? That is an excellent question. And when they go under attack, the first choice Tony makes in the film is to worry about himself, not the young soldier. Wait, 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 give me a gun! Here! So within these first three freaking minutes, we know that Tony is a narcissist who enjoys his playboy reputation, and we know that he is entirely selfish. He's the most important person in his world, and everyone else is there to take a picture. Yeah, peace. I love peace. I'll be out of a job with peace. But what is his enemy? What's going to cause the conflict that will force him to change? Who is the real big bad of the film? Himself. There is something so poetic and frankly genius about Tony Stark having pieces of his missile, his past sins, constantly being seconds away from entering his heart and killing him. And this all happens before the title card. This all shows you what director Jon Favreau cares about, and he cares about Tony Stark. John brought everything. John is the primal force behind Iron Man. He's easily half the character. He's infused himself into every department. He's an, I won't say he's a gentle giant because he's very formidable, but he is the most composed person in a position of unimaginable stress that I've ever seen. He's so gracious and so evolved. This is a Tony Stark movie first, not a world building machine and not a movie about a cool exec with a heart of steel. Iron Man is a film about a deeply flawed Tony Stark facing his past mistakes, his demons, and growing into a better man by becoming the Iron Man. Every choice, every line, every scene is in service of Tony Stark. I think Iron Man's biggest risk was having the title character start off as this deeply flawed dickhead. Someone that, on a surface level, the audience can't relate to. He's no Peter Parker. He's no Steve Rogers. He isn't a poor, relatable young man with a good heart, but a grown billionaire arms dealer who does plenty of awful, awful things, seemingly feels no remorse and finds a way to justify it all. What do you say to your other Nickname, the Merchant of Death. That's not bad. After the title card, we get a day in the life of Tony Stark. The editing is fast, and the filmmaking is frantic, excessive, the soundtrack is punky, the debauchery and douchery is heavy. The only time the film, and Tony, really slows down and switches tones is when we are introduced to Pepper Potts. Indeed I am. It's also the first time in the movie where Tony genuinely seems to care about who he is talking to. He's been asked a ton of questions from people he probably views as beneath him, but with Pepper, he asks back. It's your birthday. Yes. I knew that. Already? Yeah, isn't that strange? It's the same day as last year. Well, get yourself something nice for me. He engages. Oh, it was very nice. Yeah. Very tasteful. Thank you, Mr. Stark. Yeah. You're welcome, Miss Potts. One cool driving montage and a womanizing scene on an airplane later and we end up back in the cave. <laughs> the cave. These might be my favorite scenes in the film and some of my favorite bits in the entire MCU. We not only get to see the iconic birth of the arc reactor and of the Mark I, we not only get to hear Ramin Jawadi's Iron Man theme, which is so freaking incredible and just makes me want to go into the world with a box of scraps and build some shit. <laughs> Hell yeah. It should be a sin that Marvel didn't consistently use this as the definitive Iron Man theme. I hear this and I hear Iron Man, just like I heard Superman with John Williams and Batman with Danny Elfman. We not only get all that, but we get crucial character building scenes with Tony and Yinsen. The pacing slows down and we spend time getting to see the Tony Stark that's buried beneath all the ego. The Tony Stark that feels fear. The Tony Stark that may have some regrets about his lifestyle. Got a family? Yes. And I will see them when I leave here. And you stop? So you're a man who has everything and nothing. 
Tony Stark the human being and not the celebrity. Something that has always stuck out to me is this bit right here. What do I call you? My name is Jensen. Jensen, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. This takes place after Yinsen, who is the best Uncle Ben since Uncle Ben, has saved Tony's life. Played interpreter to these terrorists and stuck his neck out for this guy 10 times over. It's only after Yinsen and him start building something together does Tony bother to ask his name. It tells us so much about what Tony respects in a person and how guarded he is and has been with most people in the past. The cave is not only where we learn these things about Tony, but where Tony learns through Yinsen the lesson or rather the call to action that will come to define his character across all of the MCU. Thank you for saving me. Don't waste it. Don't waste your life. And he doesn't. After that moment, he doesn't waste a second of it. He emerges from the cave a changed man. We now know who he is and have an idea of the man he is going to become. We started off here and, and now coming out of here, I, I feel like I understand who Tony Stark is more. I think Robert does as well. He destroys all of his weapons like a badass, gets rescued, gets himself a cheeseburger, and calls this press conference where he immediately starts taking responsibility for the harm his company has caused. For a movie that had no set script, there is a very natural progression of Tony's character through the mostly improvised dialogue through his actions and his reactions. Being prisoner for three months, losing someone who he let in, and seeing firsthand the death and destruction his legacy has brought to the innocent is the kick in the ass he needed to grow. It's clear through his interaction with the press that Tony is much humbler, much more down to earth. Literally, he asks everyone to sit down so he is with the people and not speaking down to them. He's also much more vulnerable, not only with the press, I never got to say goodbye to my father, but with Pepper. I don't have anyone. I don't see their relationship talked about that much outside of those weird Instagram shit pages, but I kind of think that Tony and Pepper's relationship is one of the best romantic dynamics in a superhero franchise, especially in these earlier films. There's something real and not overly idealized about it. She's more his overworked caretaker than sexy assistant or damsel in distress, and he's far from the perfect good-natured superhero. Pepper makes Tony want to be better, be more grounded. Her character honestly helps ground the entire film. We have a billionaire, an Air Force colonel, and a scheming corporate tycoon as our central characters. Pepper is the relatable one, the put-together human being stressed out by all this madness. Speaking of human, the building of the Mark II and Tony learning to fly is magnificent stuff. It's very reminiscent of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. We get to see the learning curve our hero has to go through before he can don the iconic costume. I love the use of comedy here. It never sticks out as being so desperate to get a laugh from the audience, but rather used to remind us that no matter how fucking dope Tony Stark is, no matter what insane creation he builds in a super cool montage, he's still just a human being who is struggling to figure all this out just like we would. Kill power. The blessing of an origin movie is spending time on the smaller things that will be taken for granted in future installments. Like this. How fucking amazing is that? That's the first time we ever saw Iron Man, Silver Iron Man, but still the Iron Man. Favreau knows how important this moment is. He knows that it'll be instantly iconic and he knows not to rush over it. I think just the feeling of flying for the first time in a movie like this, if you handle it right, should give you chills. Just seeing him fly, really feeling like you're flying with him. If you cover it the right way, shoot it the right way, present it to the audience in the right way, it should be an emotional experience. What's it really like? What would it really be like to get in a suit that could fly? It would be a life-changing experience. Don't lose sight of that, you're making a movie. And movies are about emotion. They're about allowing the audience to experience something they can't in real life. But let them experience it in a real way. We rode in the Batmobile with Batman, we swung with Spider-Man, and now we are flying with 
Iron Man. I can't overstate how genius of an idea it was to be able to get a close-up of Tony's face while he was in the suit. You never lose Robert Downey Jr. and you never lose the character of Tony Stark. It allows moments like flying, like the action bits, to feel even more real. In fact, this entire movie has a sense of realness, not just in the storytelling, but in the way the film was made. From the free-flowing cinematography by Matthew Libatique to the choice of using real sets with dynamic lighting setups instead of a green screen backdrop, to the stunning gorgeous practical armors built by Stan Winston Studios, all of these decisions behind the camera make Iron Man feel like it was crafted by hand constructed, built in a cave. With a box of scraps! I was shocked to find out just how much of this film was done practically. Of course, there are some scenes, some bits of action, and some parts of Tony's armor that you could never pull off without the aid of CGI, but watching the behind the scenes and realizing that they built armors that could do this, or this, or this, Realizing that they shot during a sandstorm, realizing they really blew all this shit up, realizing that they really had Stuntman and Downey on wires zooming around doing crazy shit like this. Realizing all of that reminded me just how much Marvel's way of making movies has changed. I'm not discrediting all the hard work the thousands of extremely talented VFX artists do on these movies, but I will personally always be more invested in the story if the world it takes place in feels this tangible, feels this built, feels this real. Now, all of that craftsmanship is insanely fucking cool, but none of that would really matter if the movie wasn't meaningful, if Iron Man didn't have the weight it has. Let me ask you a question. You can go down in the comments and answer it. I'm genuinely curious. When does Tony become Iron Man to you? What exact moment in the film made you think, huh, this douchebag has grown. He is now Iron Man. He is now a hero. Some of you might say as soon as he leaves the cave and destroys his weapons. Some might say it's when he fully embraces embraces that identity in the final seconds of the film. Others might argue it's when he puts on the Mark III for the first time. Now, I don't think any of those are wrong. Honestly, they are all extremely valid. But to me, Tony Stark has always become Iron Man right before that Mark III suit up. Right after he finds out that shutting down the weapons division wasn't enough. Violence has been attributed to a group of foreign fighters referred to by locals as the Ten Rings. As you can see, these men are heavily armed and on a mission. He starts blasting shit. He's fed up. The need to take responsibility and do something is overwhelming him. And it's in this moment, right here, right when he looks at himself, looks at what he has done with his entire life, hearing what the Stark legacy really is, being overwhelmed with such disgust and regret at the sight of the great Tony Stark. Tony Stark, the narcissist. Tony Stark, the playboy. Tony Stark, the merchant of death. It's only then, only after he destroys his reflection, only after he destroys that image of himself that Tony Stark can truly become Iron Man. And Iron Man goes and kills all these asshats, walks away from an explosion, destroys the rest of his weapons, rights the wrongs of Stark Industries and of Tony Stark. He returns home and we get this powerful line that acts as the perfect period on this long sentence of a character arc. I shouldn't be alive, unless it was for a reason. I'm not crazy, Pepper. I just finally know what I have to do. And I know in my heart that it's right. Most people say the worst part about Iron Man is its third act, and I think there is a major reason why. Tony is pretty much done growing, and you could pretty much end the movie here, and we would have a seriously great, complete, and thoughtful story about one man's journey to be better. But this is a superhero movie, and superhero movies need to have a villain for the hero to punch and blow shit up with. 
lot of people don't like my bald baby boy, OB, Obadiah Stain, and I can see why. He ain't that deep, he ain't complex, sympathetic, layered, and my least favorite part of the film is the standard smaller iron dude fights bigger, badder iron dude, but I also think Stain helps serve Tony's growth. He helps support the idea that Tony must destroy his ironmongering past in order to fully become Iron Man. We're ironmongers, we make weapons. My name on the side of the building. And what we do keeps the world from falling into chaos. Not based on what I saw. Stain ordered the hit on Tony. He indirectly caused the journey that would make him a hero. I wish the movie focused in on that more, gave Jeff Bridges more to do, made the idea that he is what Tony could become if he gave into his selfishness and ego. They hint at it a little, but a little bit more would have been nice. Iron Man's third act is pretty much about driving the point of the first two acts home. The action is fine and dandy, but now that Tony has finished growing, we get to see his new self in action. What does he prioritize? The safety of the innocent or his father's and company's legacy? I think the answer to that question is clear, not only because Tony destroys the original arc reactor, killing his mentor, sort of father figure, business partner in the process while making the sacrifice play. Push it! something that he will do time and time again, but let's rewind for a second. Back to when Stain takes Tony's new arc reactor. Tony is about to die. He looks like death, probably feels even worse, but what saves him? It wasn't his money that saved him. It wasn't Stain. It wasn't anything to do with his enormous amount of power, control, or wealth. It was his relationship with Pepper, it was the effort he put into building and caring for Dummy, it was his friendship with Rhodey, it was his humanity, his kindness, the things and people he took for granted. It was his heart that saved his life. There's something so subtle yet so powerful about him using that arc reactor to fight Stain, save the woman he loves, save the innocent, and save the day. And finally, because of all this, because of the last 1 hour and 56 minutes, this ending just isn't one of the coolest, most iconic endings of all time, but the final answer to the film's overarching question. Who is Tony Stark? Is he the man who indirectly got these soldiers killed? Is he the womanizing douchebag who lets everyone meaningful in his life down by being entirely self-absorbed? Is he the man who can justify all his wrongdoings? Is he truly the merchant of death? Truth is, don't waste it. I am Iron Man. Iron Man is one of the most rewatchable movies I've ever seen. It's engaging, funny, fast paced, visually a blast, but what matters is that it has this heart to it, this complexity, this realness underneath all the fireworks. There are two ways to go. One is just to create a spectacle that people could, you know, munch popcorn and ogle at and enjoy, and that certainly is a lucrative proposition. But as a filmmaker who's gonna be working on this thing for two years and possibly other films to come, it's important for me to, to have a, an aspect to it that I could really buy into beyond just you know being a just a treat for the audience you also want to do something where you're telling a story and maybe speaking to something and going for something a little bit more without that mentality without the heart the film has and tony stark grew to have i don't know if it would have been the critical and financial hit that it was i don't know if we would have gotten 22 more movies in this infinity saga everyone involved in the making of iron man seemingly had a blast from kevin feige to john favreau to robert downey jr to stan lee who's the best director of any uh <laughs> Marvel movie. Well, not only the best, but as far as I'm concerned, John Favreau That's is right. the only okay. director. <laughs> <laughs> Unless some other director gets me a half a dozen pretty films. <laughs> but none of them knew what would happen. None of them knew that they were changing the course of superhero movies and blockbuster filmmaking in general. None of them had any idea the lasting impact and legacy Iron Man would have. I know that I'm proud of it. I know that we've done everything we can. It built from like a, a small little grassroots thing into something where people are anticipating it. And now it's being spoken of in the same breath as like Batman and Indiana Jones. I mean, we weren't part of that conversation when we started out off. We were like an unknown quantity. But I do feel confident going in and I get the suspicion that I'll be doing more of these and you know, it could potentially change the, you know, the, the nature of, of my whole life and my whole career.
just remember laying there buried waist deep in all this gear and I just remember kind of I was inside the helmet and I just had this great moment of gratitude to kind of the elements and what a privilege it was to be able to be there playing this guy with the caliber of people I was working with. I just said, wow, man, what a cool deal. What a cool suit, what a great crew, what a blast. Tony Stark. <laughs> and that's the true insanity of Iron Man. A movie that didn't have a finished script, a movie that was essentially a $140 million independent film. A movie that not only spawned an entire cinematic universe, but introduced us to who would become one of the most beloved fictional characters of all time. I mean, how amazing is that? For the rest of your life, you are 